Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss deferred income taxes. Specifically, we're going to be discussing this topic, deferred income taxes, when financial statement consolidation exists. Now, why am I making this distinction? Because we did cover deferred income taxes in much, much, much more details in intermediate accounting. Simply put, in intermediate accounting, I have 10 different lectures for this topic. So when you are taking advanced accounting, which is financial statement consolidation chapter, the assumption is you already completed your intermediate accounting course. In intermediate accounting, we cover this concept, deferred income taxes. So all what I'm trying to say is I may not go a little bit in depth as I might go because the topic is not about deferred income taxes. It's about deferred income taxes when it comes to consolidation. So if you're not comfortable with deferred income taxes, just go to my intermediate accounting, finish those lessons, then come back. However, I will do a quick review about the overall concept about deferred income taxes. Why deferred income taxes arises? Well, simply put, we have two sets of books when it comes to companies, US companies. For tax purposes, they have to pay their taxes based on the IRS code. Then we have US GAAP, where they have to prepare their financial statement, which is called financial reporting. So as a result of do, those two sets of standard or two sets of rules, differences would arise. How we account for something for tax may not be the same for US GAAP. How, how we account for something under US GAAP may not be the same as tax. Well, as a result, we're going to have differences. What are some examples of these differences? For example, the way we depreciate an asset under tax is totally, not totally, it's different than we, than we do depreciation under US GAAP. So as a result, the book value of our fixed asset, property, plant, and equipment, for tax purposes will differ from the book value of the US GAAP-based book value. Why? Because the depreciation amount is different. Revenue recognition, the way you recognize revenue under the internal revenue code, we might have to use the percentage of completion, and under US GAAP, we might have to use the completed contract or vice versa. Warranty liability expense, the way we account for warranty liability under US Treasury Code or the US tax system is when you pay it, you take it. You take the expense. Under US GAAP, you can accrue this expense. And this is just a sample of examples, and there's many, many of them. I just want to just a quick review to kind of set the ground for what I'm doing here. So difference result in either a taxable liability or deductible amount. So simply put, if you have a taxable, if, if that difference is going to result in more taxes in the future, you're going to have a liability. If that difference is going to result in more savings, more deductible, you're going to have a deferred taxed asset. Again, this is the simplified version of it. Income tax deferral amount depend whether the consolidation reporting entity files a consolidated or a separate return. So when it comes to consolidation, it also makes a difference whether the parent company is including all the subs. So the parent company and the sub, they're all filing one tax return. And we talked about when would that happen and why. Or, or if the parent company and the sub, each one of them, in other words, the subs are also filing their own separate income tax return. Specifically, we have to be aware of a few topics here. Intra-entity dividend, when we have a dividend transfer, the impact of goodwill and other intangibles, and intra-entity profit. And for intra-entity profit, we're going to break them into two parts. The intra-entity profit when it comes to inventory, intra-entity profit other than inventory. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over these concepts explain 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 them briefly then work an example illustrating the concept before we proceed any further i have a public announcement about my company farhatlectures.com farhat accounting lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your cpa exam preparation as well as your accounting courses my cpa material is aligned with your cpa review course such as becker roger wiley gleam miles my accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses, broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. Let's start with inter-entity dividend. What do we need to know? Well, when it comes to GAAP, Dividends are eliminated. Why? Between the subsidiary and the parents because they represent inter-entity cash transfer. Well, they are simply eliminated. Under the tax law, that's the same concept as long as 
the parent owned more than 80% of the subsidiary. Under those circumstances, dividends are also removed. Why? Here you need to know a little bit of tax rule, and I'm assuming you already took your tax course. If you own more than 80% of a particular company, well, you would report the dividend as dividend income. So let's assume the company paid you $80,000 in dividend income. Then this is part of your income. Then when it comes to your deduction or your expenses, you're going to have something called DRD, dividend received deduction, and you will be able to take it out. So you would report it as income, then you will have the dividend received deduction, it will eliminate it. Therefore, if you own more than 80%, it's the same effect as when you consolidate, it's considered intercompany cash transfer. In other words, there are no differences at that level. What happened if you own less than 80% of the subsidiary? Well, if you own less than 80% of the subsidiaries, for financial accounting purposes, you, can, you could still consider it inter-entity transfer. Here, is, here we are assuming you are consolidating, you own more than 50%. That's fine. For tax purposes, if you own less than 80%, then you cannot deduct the whole thing. 35% of it is taxable. So if you report $80,000 in dividend income, if this is the income, the only expense you can take now from this is 35% of this can be deducted. So 35% of this can be deducted. In other words, there's going to be a difference between your dividend income for tax purposes and your dividend income for financial accounting, which is zero because you you eliminate it because as a result of having a future liability because now you have a an amount to pay you're going to create a liability for that dividend also dividend declared but not yet paid well when you declare a dividend okay but you did not pay it yet well guess what you have a tax liability in the future because once you clear a dividend the subsidiary is going to pay it they have not paid it yet well regardless since they now you have a liability on the books and it's going to be paid into the future you're going to be paid you're going to be paid in the future then it's going to create a difference because you have a liability for tax you don't have a liability for financial accounting the amount will differ therefore it's going to create a tax payment in the future as a result you have a deferred tax liability again when does this exist when you have less than 80 percent ownership the liability will the liability amount will differ between the two impact of goodwill now if you don't know what goodwill is it's when you purchase another company and you purchase more than its uh, identifiable identifiable fair market value how does the tax law treat intangibles intangibles of goodwill and other purchased asset referred to as section 197 are amortized over 15 years so you will take the deduction over 15 years when it comes to gap what do you have to do with goodwill you have to evaluate goodwill and if it's impaired you write it off so Let's assume you purchase a goodwill or curated goodwill or you purchase an intangible asset and for the sake of illustration it's fifteen thousand you're gonna divide it by 15 years and every year you'll take a thousand that's for tax when it comes to gap you're gonna have that fifteen thousand on the books and you don't do anything unless that asset is impaired so you only take a deduction you only take a deduction not deduction an expense to differentiate you only take an expense for gap when that asset is impaired. So if that asset is impaired, is not impaired, what's gonna happen after year one, the book value of it after year one will be 15,000 because you did not you did not take any expenses. For tax purposes, it will be 14,000 because 15 minus one is 14,000. Notice there's a difference. And this is what's gonna create the difference for the goodwill. So the presence of tax deductible goodwill create a temporary difference. We're going to have deferred income taxes. It could be an asset, could be a liability. Because for tax purposes, you may only take a thousand. Then for gap, well, you find out that was a bad deal. When you bought this company, you might have to take 5,000 in expenses. So notice, now you have more deduction for gap. So it, it could differ between the two. You could have a deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability. Just be aware of this. Also, a temporary difference exists for other purchase intangible asset that qualify under section 197 property again here you have to know be familiar with a little bit with the tax rules inter-entity profit specifically i said we're going to deal with inventory and inter-entity profit other than inventory will be dealt with separately because they use separate rules just to review if you remember when we talked about inter-entity profit when it comes to consolidated financial statements simply put we're consolidating everything any gross profit from the sale of inventory on an intra-entity profit, so the, the parent selling the sub, the sub selling to the parent is deferred until that inventory is sold to a third party. And if you remember, uh, when I explained this, I said, okay, this is the parent, this is the sub, and do it this way. This is the parent and this is the sub. They're going to sell each other and they're going to have profit. As long as that profit within the whole entity 
it didn't go outside this entity, it's the third. As long as what? As long as they're consolidating, of course. Well, guess what? The same concept apply if we are consolidating for tax purposes. So if also the parent and the sub, and could be many subs, they're also consolidating also with the furthest. We defer this profit, we defer this profit. If a separate return is filed, now we have the parent and we have the sub. For financial accounting, they are consolidating, but when it comes to tax, they have their own tax return, they have their own tax return. If that's the case, if that's the case, the gross profit is recognized in taxable income. Here you can you can no longer say I'm going to defer it for tax purposes because you're not consolidating. So from a tax perspective, what they're saying is from a tax perspective, each entity is different. So what's happening here is something like this. When you tax is paid on intra intra company profit from inventory, it's considered a prepayment. So when the sub, let's assume the sub have an intra entity profit and they paid their taxes because they already paid their taxes on that profit. When they actually sell it to a third party later on, the taxes are already, are already paid. So what's going to happen? Because you paid your taxes, it's going to give you a deferred taxed asset. Or, or if the parent paid the taxes on, on that inter entity profit. Why? Because you paid it. And it's not sold to an outside party yet. So if you paid it and not sold to an outside party yet, you prepaid your taxes. So when it's sold to an outside party, you don't have to worry about this because you already paid your taxes on that profit. So that's why. When it comes to inter-entity profit other than inventory, well, what's other than inventory if you sold equipment, land, other assets? Well, recognize the related income tax effect and the period in which the transfer the transfer occurs. So when that happened, you do it. You, you, you recognize the taxes. There is no deferred component. So for inter-entity profit other than inventory, you just have to pay your taxes. Now, as a result, let's assume you sold a piece of equipment or or land or a machinery. Now, usually, usually if you do that, you might, you know, let's assume you have a gain to or a loss. It doesn't matter. What's going to happen after the fact, there's going to be a difference between the book value and the tax basis. So you're going to have the difference between the book value of that asset and it's the book value for financial and the tax basis, which is the IRS. We're going to have a difference and you're going, they're going to have a different de depreciation amount. And this is a separate story. We'll account for that differently. But the gain or the loss on the transaction itself is not deferred. It will create a deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability because the book value between the two will differ, but not. But we're not talking about this. We're talking about the depreciation. The depreciation amount might be different then we'll account for that separately. This is what we talk about when we discuss the third income taxes and intermediate accounting. Now, the best way to illustrate this concept is take a look at an example, just kind of get a feeling of how this works. So I'm going to switch to an Excel sheet and take a look at, a, at an example. Okay, let's take a look at this example. On January 1st, 20x0, Adam purchased 85% of Ryan outstanding shares. What does that tell us? If we have more than 50, we can consolidate for financial accounting purposes. If we have more than 85, now we can also consolidate for tax purposes if we choose. If we choose. Remember, if we don't, we don't have to. We're assuming Ryan is a domestic company. Domestic means it's a U.S. company uh, because we're assuming here home is the U.S. The tax rate is 21%. Now we're going to be giving the data for X0, the data for X1, and we're going to determine the tax expense and the tax payable for assuming they file a consolidated return or assuming they file a separate return. Let's take a look at the data that we are giving. Since we are giving two years, let's look at both years. Sales, 600,000. Operating expense, 400,000. Intercompany gross profit included with sales, 120. So this is intercompany gross profit and it's included in sales. Dividend income from Ryan, which Ryan, this is how much we received. We own 85% of Ryan. Ryan paid 30, we received 25,500. And in 20X0, Ryan generated 210, operating expenses of 130. The question is about 20X1. Why am I going over 20X0? Well, the reason is because the intercompany gross profit that was included in sales, okay, uh, that was included in sales will be deferred will be the third. What does that mean? It's mean it's remember if they consolidate, it's going to be the third. It means this 20, 120,000, we assume it's going to be realized in 20 X one. So we have to add it to the 20 X one. Now in 20 X one, we had sales of 800,000 for Adam operating expenses of 500,000. And we have an inter entity profit included in sales of 150. Now we have 150 included in this amount. Well, this is intercompany. What do we do if we consolidate? We are going to 
the third is till x2 so it's important to understand why i am i am i am emphasizing those intercompany gross profit that's included in sales in x1 included in sales in x2 but for for consolidating it's going to be the third so then ryan uh, then adam received 42500 from ryan ryan's sales was 370 operating expenses 270 so let's take a look at their uh, tax bill <coughs> sorry assuming they filed a consolidated return adam will have adam income will be 250 which is 800,000 minus 550 um ryan income is 100,000 which is 370 minus 270 now you might be saying why didn't we include the dividend from ryan as part of income yes we do include this so the dividend from ryan we do include 42,500 this is dividend income then on the same tax return we're going to have a something called dividend received deduction I, I i emphasized earlier then we'll take the deduction so the effect is zero so that's why it kind of you know adam's income is 250 because if we include the dividend we're going to have to deduct it as a deduction then the net effect is zero and bear in mind whether we file a consolidated return or each company file a separate return adam would still qualify for the dividend received deduction because Adam owns 85, which is more than 80%. So the dividend received deduction does not, is not only applicable when we file a consolidated return. It's always applicable or available to the taxpayer as long as they own more than 80% of the other corporation. Now, remember this 120,000? That was the third. Well, it was the third from 20x0. Now it's going to be in 20x1. So we're going to add this 120,000 to our taxable income because it was the third. Then this 150,000 that was generated in 20x1 will have to deduct because this is going to x2. So all in all, if we take Adam income, Ryan income, add the deferred profit from the prior year, subtract the deferred profit that's going to next year, we're going to have a taxable income of 320. We said the tax rate is 21%. Assuming my Excel is working properly, you have a tax bill to the IRS of 67,002. 167,200. Now, from an income tax perspective as well, the income tax expense is also 67,200 because there's no difference. We consolidated, and since we consolidated, we don't create a difference. Simply put, <clears throat> the, defer, the, uh, the profit is deferred. The profit is deferred, therefore no difference. So inter-entity profit on inventory is not taxed till it's sold to an outside party. So we did not pay any taxes on it. Therefore, there is no deduction or, or benefit from that. Therefore, the, the expense and the liabilities are the same. And remember, the dividend is subject to dividend received deduction. Therefore, we're going to debit tax expense, tax expense, 67,200, credit tax payable, or taxes payable 67,200 and that's it for that's it for the filing a consolidated return okay now let's assume let's assume now let's assume they file a separate return if they file a separate return what's going to happen adam will have 250,000 let me just delete this 250,000 which is 850 minus 5 500,000 the tax rate is 21% and they're going to have a tax bill of 52,500. So, what are we going to do with the with this amount 150,000? Hold on on this amount because this is that's, a, that's what's going to create the difference between between Adam and Ryan. But let's let's compute it one piece at a time. Ryan will have 100,000 of taxable income times 21% is 21,000. So, for now, here's what happened. <coughs> Adam Company will have a tax bill of 52,500. Ryan Company will have a tax bill of 21,000. Together, they will have an income taxes payable. Let me credit this because this is the credit. So they have to send to the IRS each one of them 52,500, 21,000, total 73,500. Now we need to discuss the differences because when it comes to when they file separately, when they file separately, guess what? They have to pay taxes on that difference. Okay, let's go back to 20x0. In 20x0, remember, this is not deferred. In 20x0, the company paid on the 120,000, 25,200. What, what is that number coming from? Remember, for 20x0, because if, if we're filing separately, nothing is deferred. Therefore, Adam Company paid 
25,200. So that was paid, that 120,000. Well, that we paid that amount, okay? Remember, we paid we paid that amount. That amount means the 25,200. We paid it in 20x0. Then the profit, then this profit was accounted for in 20x1 because it was the third. Now, we actually sold it to a third party in 20x1. Well, that's great. We should have have, because we sold it, we should have have a tax prepayment. In other words, we already took care of this 120,000. Now, the... The 150,000 here, remember this 150,000, as we are told, it's included, the 150,000 is included in sales. So this 150,000, we also paid taxes on it. How much was the taxes specifically? In other words, it's included with this amount here. How much was the taxes? Well, if we take 150,000 times 21%, will give us the amount 31,500. Now here's what happened. We included the two figures, we included the, uh, we included 120,000 in income from year X zero, which taxes were paid on it, basically. Then we included 150,000 and we also paid taxes on it. So here's what's gonna happen. Of this 150, 120 representing this 120 because we deferred it, now we're paying taxes. We already paid taxes on that. So what's left is we actually paid extra taxes on the 30,000, extra taxes. So we paid an additional, whatever that is, 30,000, if we take 30,000 times 0.21, what we paid, we paid an additional 6,300, 6,300 in taxes. Why did we pay an additional 6,300? Well, because the 120 that we included this year, taxes were already paid for it. The 150, what's going to happen, we're also going to have to pay taxes on it, but of the 150, we're going to assume 120 of it goes to the prior year. So what's left is the extra 30,000. Now this extra 30,000, it's going to a prepayment for 20x2, and this is going to be a deferred taxed asset. It's going to be debited to deferred tax asset. Therefore, we're going to send the IRS a check of 73,500. Okay, is this our tax expense? No, this is not our total tax expense. Why? Because of the 73,500, 6,300 of it is for the portion of the intra-entity profit on inventory that's going to be paid in 20x2. Therefore, we create a deferred tax asset of 6,300. Well, the income tax expense is what we paid to the IRS minus the amount that we paid for future taxes, which is 73,500 minus 6,300 income tax expense. This will be always a plug. If you remember, if you follow my uh, intermediate accounting, income tax expense is always a plug if need be. But if you want to understand it, we paid 73,500 of which 6,300 is for future years. Therefore, income tax expense for the current year is 6,200, 6,200. So this is how we compute our income tax expense for this particular year. So this illustration um, shows you what happened if the company filed a consolidated return, if the company filed a separate return. Now, specifically, what are the benefits of filing a separate return? That's going to have to be discussed separately. Maybe in the next session, I will explain to you, you know, filing a separate return, why, why not? And maybe we'll look at another example. Again, advanced accounting is by its nature advanced accounting. It's difficult. <laughs> so think about what we're doing here. It's advanced accounting. It is inter-entity profit, Okay. And a lot of people find difficulty in advanced accounting. A lot of people find difficulties in inter-entity profit. And a lot of people find difficulties in, in, and what? In the third taxes. So we're taking all these three concepts and combining them in this example. So if you are a little bit overwhelmed, uh, I hate to use the word confused, but it's okay. Even if you feel confused, that's normal. So the point is to do what? Go back and learn about the third income taxes. Make sure you know, understand this. Make sure you know how inter-entity profit works. Make sure you know this. Then come back here and put all three together. Yes, it's challenging. You can do it. I'm always here to help you. Whether you are studying for your CPA exam, advanced accounting, or whatever certification you are doing, accounting is worth it. Study hard. Good luck and stay safe.